Welcome to Chapter 4, Part 2 of our course on Engineering Statics, MEC 260. We're going to pick up this discussion where we left off at the end of Part 1. We will review Sample Problem 4.6, Determine the Rope Tension and Reaction when Lifting a Joist. A ceiling joist is shown on the picture on the right with a partially constructed frame of a house. The ceiling joists hold up your roof, and they're not easy to lift on top of the roof. Usually there's a couple of people involved. But this guy on the diagram on the left is trying to do it all by himself. And predictably, he's finding it's very difficult. He's pulling on a rope shown in a blue line with the tension T, and he's using a step in the ground at point A to try to rotate the joist. And he's finding that when he first started pulling, he didn't have much leverage and it was incredibly hard. And now he has the joist rotated to the point where there's a 25 degree angle between his rope and the axis of the joist. And there's a 45 degree angle between the axis of the joist and the ground. It's still pretty hard to pull. It's not going to be easy to pull until he gets the joist mostly vertical. But we'll find the tension in the rope at these exact angles. We'll draw a free body diagram of the system, create a force triangle, and compute forces via some complex trigonometry and geometry. Step one in the lower left, we draw the free body diagram as shown in figure one. We have three forces, the tension T in the rope, the reaction R from the ground, and the weight W of the joist. The weight W acts at a point G, which is the centroid of the joist, and it has a weight of 98.1 newtons because the joist had a mass of 10 kilograms. The line of sight of the reaction R is not through the axis of the joint, it's as shown. And point C is where the line of sight of the three forces meet, but we don't know where point C is right now. We're going to have to do some complex geometry and trigonometry to figure that out, which is what we're doing in figure two. We've drawn the rectangle CDFE and We've drawn the triangle CBD. We've put in the angles we do know, the pair of 45 degree angles and this 25 degree angle between CB and the axis of the joist. We know that the joist is four meters long, and that's between points A and B. We don't know what angle alpha is between AC and the ground, but we're going to need to figure that out in order to draw the proper force triangle. Now we'll analyze the lines of action for the three forces acting through point C. Before we do that, we'll figure out some other angles and algebraic relationships. Let's study triangle CBD. We know that this angle between CB and the axis of the joist is 25 degrees, and we drew in this 45 degree angle between AB and AF, and that we could do because we knew that there was a 45 degree angle here between the joist and the ground. Now 25 and 45 degrees add to 70 degrees, which means this angle where my red arrow is showing, that's the angle between CB and BD is a 70 degree angle which means that the tangent of that 70 degree angle is opposite over adjacent, so that's CD divided by BD. The cotangent of 70 degrees is just the tangent of 20 degrees, and that's one over the ratio of CD over BD, which is BD over CD. And then a little more algebra that BD equals CD times tangent of 20 degrees. Point G is the centroid of the beam located at the halfway point from A to B, which means that AG equals GB and EF equals AE by similar triangles. Now let's focus on some more algebra. We know that AF is equal to 
BF because this is a 45-45 isosceles triangle. But BF equals AB, which is the hypotenuse of that triangle, times cosine of 45 degrees, which means that length AF is 4 meters times cosine of 45 degrees, which equals 2.828 meters. CD, which is this short side of the rectangle, is equal to EF, the other side of the rectangle, and that's equal to AE, and that's just one half of the length AF. But we just calculated the length of AF, which means that from C to D is 1.414 meters. BD, this short little section, is equal to CD times cotangent of 70 degrees, but that was just CD, which is 1.414 times the tangent of 20 degrees. And we take that number, it's 0.515 meters. CE, which is the long side of this rectangle, equals DF, the opposite long side. But DF is just BF minus little section BD. And we can plug in numbers for BF and BD, CE and DF. These are the long sides of the rectangle are 2.313 meters. Now we can find angle alpha because CE was 2.313 and AE was 1.414 and the tangent of alpha is just CE over AE which comes out to 1.636 which means alpha equals the arc tangent of 1.636 which is 58.6 degrees. Now we can finally draw a force triangle. For the force triangle, we need these three forces that were in our original free body diagram. Start with force W, the weight of the joist at 98.1 meters. Put it here on the left. Then we can draw in resultant R. Resultant R makes an angle with the ground of 58.6 degrees, which is equal to alpha. Therefore, the angle between W and R is 90 minus 58.6 degrees, so that's 31.4 degrees. At the end, we draw in T, which connects the tip of R to the tail of W. T, in the original problem, made an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal. So that's all we have to do for T, is just rotate it down 20 degrees as we head down and connect T to W because T made an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal that this obtuse angle in the triangle is just 90 plus 20, which is 110 degrees. And by subtraction, 180 minus 31.4 minus 110 equals 38.6 degrees for the third angle in the force triangle. We know three angles of the force triangle and one side and we can use our law of sines to calculate T and R, which are the other two sides of the force triangle. Right here on the left, we're just setting up our law of sines equations, and we find that T equals 81.9 newtons, and R equals 147.8 newtons, and an angle of 58.6 degrees relative to the ground. Here is an Excel spreadsheet that shows you the flow of all these calculations. I did verify that all the numbers in the book are correct. Now we'll switch to 3D equilibrium force analysis and we'll show a rigid body subject to three forces in figure 4.9a in the lower left. Because that rigid body is in equilibrium, summing the moments at any point equals zero for our three forces, F1, F2, and F3, which are shown respectively acting through points A, B, and C. But suppose the line of action of F1 and F2 intersect at point D, which is shown in figure 4.9b. Point D is an arbitrary point in this rigid body, 
but it will exist somewhere. It's just a question of extending the line of sight of F2, extending back the line of sight of F1, and showing where they intersect. Because the sum of the moments equals zero for F1 and F2 about point D, after all, they act through point D, the moment of F3 about point D has to be zero because the sum of moments for all forces around any point has to be zero when a rigid body is in equilibrium. Therefore, we draw F3 as acting through point D because if the sum of the moment of F3 equals zero and F3 is not zero, the only way that can happen is if F3 acts through point D. We show that in figure 4.9c and we conclude that if three forces are acting on a body that's in equilibrium, their lines of action must pass through the same point. The only exception being that if three forces, F1, F2, and F3 are parallel, obviously they won't pass through the same point on the rigid body, but certainly because they're parallel, the sum of the moments about any point of three parallel forces is going to be zero. Rigid bodies are also found in nature. Cleo's on strike there, but with a smile. She's laying in the grass. She's not going anywhere. That deer on the right, well, that's the one that eats the plants in my yard. He owns the place. He's not going anywhere either. Now, Woody, he's hiding out in a paper bag. Kind of looks like he just committed bank robbery. And that kangaroo on the right... Well, he's laying in the sun and he's just chilling. 3D problems involve up to six equations and six unknowns. You sum the x, y, z forces to zero. You can sum the x, y, and z moments to zero. But it's much easier to write the conditions for 3D equilibrium in vector format. Sum of all forces equals zero. And some of the moments around any point, we're choosing point O here, is just the sum of position vector R cross F for each of the forces, and that equals zero. By writing the conditions in vector format, we can use linear equations or determinants to find solutions. We can eliminate up to three unknown reaction components by choosing point O as the location where forces pass through. In other words, you find from geometry where the forces pass through, then you choose that point to some moments, and when you do that, you're gonna find that a lot of these forces don't have a moment, which is going to eliminate up to three unknown reactions. We can also use couples for equilibrium conditions. We have the equation below from chapter three, and we just have to set that equal to zero. When it comes to food, nature is not always Darwinian. Sometimes equilibrium is established. On the left, Woody and Cleo eat from the same bowl, and sometimes Woody shares food with Jesse. These donkeys on the bottom are going head to head for food, but they weren't really jostling much. They were being kind of patient, seeing who got their food first. And my friendly giraffe on the right, well, he's got a really long neck and a long head to reach out for food, but on top of that, he's got this eight inch long tongue. All you gotta do is put a carrot in there. He rolls his tongue up, goes into his mouth, chews on it, goes back and does it again. Now let's discuss reactions for three dimensional structures. There's more choices of components than with 2D. First, we have a force with a known line of action. These joints in 3D space prevent motion in one direction only. They include cables. Whether a cable's in 2D space or in 3D space, there's still only a force with one known line of action. On the right is a picture I took on a cloudy day of the Brooklyn Bridge walking near one of the pillars. You do get this unusual view of all the cables that are holding up the bridge, but each one of these lines is a cable and the force in that cable is just acting along the dimension of the cable. You also have what's called a ball joint, commonly used as a caster, where you 
have a metal housing and you put a spherical ball in it and no matter how you apply a force to that ball whatever is on top of that ball is only going to have a force in the axis of the structure that's on top of the ball the reason it's used as a caster is because you can wheel it around normally by the way the caster is upside down and whatever structure goes through these bolts is going to have this ball on the ground and the force is typically some vertical force coming down from a structural element and that makes it very easy to wheel around the structure. You have reactions with two unknown forces. These joints prevent motion in two directions. It includes a roller on a rough surface as shown here in the lower left that's a painting brush and when you use the brush with the roller it moves in one direction but it doesn't move in the axial direction and it doesn't move in the vertical direction which is basically how you paint. You also have a wheel on a rail which is how trains work. Here's a picture of train wheel. The train wheel keeps the train on the track by virtue of this radial section of the wheel moving on the top of the track the flange here on the outer corner keeps the train from moving laterally off the tracks. Now here in this wheel with one track, it needs two flanges to keep it from moving off the track. The way trains work is you only put a flange on the inside of a track, which prevents the wheel from moving in this view to the right. But there is also a wheel on the other side of the train on the second track that has its flange that keeps that side from moving outboard off the track. So between the two flanges and the two wheels and the two tracks the train still stays on the track unless you have a nutty conductor driving 90 miles an hour around a sharp curve. That's a different story. That's a case where the train could fall off the track. We have reactions with three unknown force components. These joints prevent motion in three directions, but they allow rotation about all three axes. The best example is a ball and socket shown here on the lower right. In this ball and socket, you can rotate the shaft of the ball in any direction you want in 3D space, but because the ball is encompassed in this flange surface of this cavity, the ball does not allow motion in X, Y, or Z. It only allows rotation about the X, the Y, or the Z axis. We have reactions with three unknown force components and one unknown couple. These type of joints prevent motion in three directions, but they do allow rotation about two axes. The best example is a universal joint, which is used in truck drive shafts. I've sketched in on the lower right where the axes would be in 3D space. This half of the joint can rotate about this upper axis and this lower half of the joint rotates about this lower axis. The universal joints in the truck drive shafts connect the output of the transmission to the rear wheels on the truck. They transfer all the mechanical power that's needed for the truck to move. We have reactions with two unknown force components and two unknown couples. These are hinges and bearings designed to support radial loads only. Our unknown moments are m sub y and m sub z and our unknown forces are f sub y and f z. In the lower left we have a cylindrical roller bearing showing the forces Fy and Fz which have to be calculated in order to specify the proper bearing. The inner race of the bearing rotates about the x-axis and supports a moment about that axis but it's unknown what the moments are around the y and the z-axis of the bearing because the bearing resists rotation about those two axes. This is true for a cylindrical roller bearing or for a spherical roller bearing. There are reactions with three unknown force components and two unknown couples. 
These include pin and bracket supports, hinges, and bearings designed to support an axial thrust as well as a radial load. In the lower left corner we show an exploded view of a thrust bearing. The x-axis, which is this one, is the axis of rotation and hence it does not support a moment about the x-axis. It only supports moments around the y and z-axis. The bearing is designed to resist forces in x, y, and z and therefore these forces are unknown components that would have to be calculated if you're going to specify a thrust bearing. And the thrust bearing works because the rollers are actually on this angle relative to the face of the bearing. Fixed supports in 3D space are reactions with three unknown force components and three unknown couples. Here's a good example of one of a park I went to. It's called the Capilano Suspension Bridge Park in Vancouver, Canada. The suspension bridge is shown here in the background as a straight long bridge about 200 feet above a canyon. But there is also what they call cliff walk, which is this 180 degree of arc cantilevered structure which you walk on that is bolted into the side of rocks and also held together by these cables. These people look like they're going about their business. Personally, I was terrified walking on this thing because it is a long way down. You can have a statically indeterminate structure in 3D space. The reactions involve more than six unknowns and you have more unknowns than equations. You can have partially constrained structures where the reactions involve fewer than six unknowns and you have more equations than unknowns and loading conditions. The rigid body would still be in equilibrium and you can have an improperly constrained structures where some equations of equilibrium are not satisfied. And this can occur when the reactions associated with the given supports either are parallel or intersect the same line. Sample problem 4.7 will put to use our equations of equilibrium for 3D forces and moments. We'll determine the reactions from a man standing on a ladder. The diagram of the ladder is in the lower left corner. It's a 20 kilogram ladder used to reach high shelves and it's supported by two flanged wheels A and B mounted on a rail on the floor. The ladder is also supported by a flangeless wheel C resting against a rail fixed to the wall. The latter is symmetric with wheel C located on the plane of symmetry, which means that wheel C is halfway between A and B, so it's 0.6 meters to the left of A. A more common and practical design for a movable ladder for a bookstore is in this photo from our friends at Amazon. Normally you put two flanged wheels on the top on a round rail and you might put two on the bottom. It's a very stable solution but it makes for very difficult vector mechanics hence the simplification in our diagram. An 80 kilogram man stands on the ladder and leans to the right. He better not lean too far or else he won't be on the ladder anymore. And the line of action of the combined weight W of the man and the ladder intersects the floor at point D. Point D is not directly below point C. Point D is 0.9 meters to the right, meaning the x-axis of point A, while point C is 0.6 meters along the x-axis to the right of point A. We'll determine the reactions at points A, B, and C in this exercise. Step one is to draw the free body diagram shown in figure one. We're using flangeless wheels and we can move easily along the x-axis on the floor, which means there are no forces A sub x and B sub x. We just have forces AZ, AY, BZ, and BY. We have a force C in the Z direction from the definition of the wheel that was given to us in the problem. It's a wheel that can only provide support in the Z direction. And the weight of the 20 kilogram ladder and the 80 kilogram man adds to 100 kilograms, which is 
981 newtons. That force is the force of gravity which acts directly downward. Now we'll sum our forces in 3D vector format. The force at point A has components A, Y, J, and A, Z, K. The force at B has components B, Y, J plus B, Z, K. We have a minus 981 newtons in J for the weight of the man in the ladder plus force C acting in the K direction, and all those forces equal to zero. In the second line, we group the forces as multipliers of J and K. There are no forces in the I direction. Now we'll sum the moments about point A in vector format. We're gonna wind up with three equations in three unknowns, where the unknowns are going to be B sub Z, b sub y and c. Whenever you define a position vector, you always have to define which point is point two and which point is point one. Position vector r c slash a, which starts at the point that we're going to calculate the moment around and has its arrow at the point where the force is. x sub c is the x component for point two, and that's 0.6, and x sub a is 0, 0.6 minus 0 is 0.6. Go through the y and z calculations, and r of c slash a is equal to 0.6i plus 3j minus 1.2k. I've also sketched in the vector r of d slash a, which connect point a, where we're taking the moment around, and puts the tip at point d, where our negative 981 newton force in j goes through. So xd minus xa is 0.9 minus 0, because point d has an x value of 0.9, and point a has an x value of 0. The y values are the same, so delta y is a zero, and z sub d is at minus 0.6, and z sub a is at zero, so z d minus z a is minus 0.6, and r d slash a is 0.9i minus 0.6k. r sub b slash a I drew in white, that's the vector that connects point a to point b, it's a simple vector because it only changes its position in x. Point B is at 0.9 plus 0.3, which is 1.2. Point A is at x equals 0, so r sub b slash a equals 1.2 times i. Now we have to calculate the cross products of the moments to find b sub y, b sub z, and c, which is represented by the vector equation summation of the moments about a equals the sum of r cross f about point a, and that equals zero due to equilibrium. So we start plugging in values, and that creates this equation up here where it's 1.2i crossed with b sub yj plus b sub z times k plus 0.9i minus 0.6k crossed with minus 981j plus 0.6i plus 3j minus 1.2k crossed with c times k. Now we're going to use our distributive properties for the vector cross product, which is why I brought all of our nine possibilities of our unit vectors crossed with each other, because we're going to have to use them. The first cross product is 1.2i, that's a typo by the way, j, 1.2i, crossed with by times j, which is 1.2 by times i cross j, and i cross j is a k, that's what the k is doing here, plus 1.2 bz times i cross k, but i cross k is negative j, that's how we get this term minus 1.2 bz times j. And our next term is plus 0.9i crossed with minus 981j. That comes out to minus 882.9, and i cross j is a k, so we leave it at minus 882.9.
And then the next term is minus 0 0.6 times minus 981 times k cross j. k cross j is minus i, so we have three negative signs, which is going to lead to a, a negative sign. So the absolute value of 0 0.6 times 981 is 588.6, but it's a negative sign, and that's an i. And our second to last term is 0.6i crossed with c times k. So that's an 0.6c, but i crossed k is negative j. So we have to put a negative j here. And 3 in j crossed with c and k. And j cross k is over here. That's an i. The last term is minus 1.2 k crossed with c times k, but that's just 0 because k cross k is 0. Rearranging terms, we get this equation that I'm circling over here. And then we take each of these three terms, 1, 2, 3, and set them to 0. And conveniently, each of those three terms that respectively multiplies our unit vectors leads to a simple algebraic equation that we can solve for c, b sub z, and b sub y, which are 196.2 newtons, minus 98.1 newtons, and 736 newtons, respectively. Vector b has two terms. It's plus 736 newtons times j, minus 98.1 newtons times k, and vector C is just 196.2 newtons times K. In step five, we substitute the calculated values of B sub Y, B sub Z, and C into the force equations of step two to find AY and AZ. This will lead to two equations and two unknowns. So this equation in the upper row that I'm pointing to is our original vector equation in step two. But we're just going to substitute by equals 736 and bz equals minus 98.1 and c equals 196.2. And we get two independent equations and two unknowns. One in this left term multiplies the j and the second term multiplies the k. Then we get Two simple equations algebraically for AY and AZ. And vector A is equal to 245 newtons. There's our 245 newtons times a J because vector A sub Y was determined as a multiplier of J. And minus 981 newtons times K where the minus 981 newtons is the magnitude of A sub Z. Now we'll have a second problem here where we'll determine the reactions in sample problem 4.8 in a ball socket in a cable from a hanging sign. Hanging signs in trade shows look like the one on the right here. They're enormous and they do hang from the ceilings with cables. They don't always hang as simply as our diagram in the lower left corner. Usually there's dozens of cables because People want to make sure that the sign doesn't fall down on people's heads. But that would make for too long a video for vector mechanics. So I'm glad in this sample problem, there's one ball joint at point A and two cables, and that's it. It's a five by eight foot sign. It's uniform density. It weighs 270 pounds, which means we can locate the weight at the center of gravity of the sign. We're going to determine the tension in cables EC and BD and the reaction at point A at the ball socket, which will have three terms, one in X, one in Y, and one in Z. In step one, we will draw the free body diagram, which is shown in figure one in the lower right. The forces acting on the sign are its weight W, which is minus 270J, force A, tension T sub EC and tension T sub BD. The reaction in point A is a force of unknown direction, which we'll represent by A sub X, A sub Y, and A sub Z. 
The magnitudes of the cable tensions are represented by magnitude T sub BD and magnitude T sub BC. And with five unknowns and six equations, the sign is only partially constrained. It can rotate freely about the x-axis, but the sign is in equilibrium because the sum of the moments about the x-axis is zero. Now we will define forces T sub BD and T sub EC in vector format. And as always, in determining the direction of a vector, we have to determine which point is point two and which point is point one. So for vector T sub BD, point D is point two and point B is point one. X sub D is equal to zero and X sub B is equal to eight. So therefore X sub D minus X sub B is equal to minus eight. Similarly, Y sub D is equal to four minus Y of point B, which is zero. So Y D minus Y B is four. And Z sub D minus Z sub B is equal to minus eight minus zero for point B, and that's equal to minus eight. And the length of BD is just the sum squares of eight squared, four squared, and minus eight squared. Take the square root of that and you get 12. For vector T sub E C, point C is X2 and point E is X1. So X C minus X E is zero, minus six for point E, there's our six, that's minus six feet. Y sub C is three minus Y of point E, which is zero, so that differential is plus three. And Z sub C is two minus Z sub E, which is zero, so that differential is two. The length of vector EC is the square root of minus six squared plus three squared plus two squared, and that turns out to be seven. Vector BD takes the three values, minus eight, four, and minus eight. Vector EC, we put in the minus six, the three, and the two. And vector T sub BD is magnitude T sub BD times vector BD divided by length BD. That's by definition. But we don't know the magnitude of T sub BD, so we're gonna leave that as a variable. In order to fill out the direction of the vector, it's minus eight divided by 12 is just minus two thirds. Four divided by 12 is a third. Minus eight divided by 12 is minus two thirds. And T sub EC has the same problem. We don't know its magnitude, so we leave that. And in order to get the coordinates in I, J, and K, we take minus six divided by seven, three divided by seven, and two divided by seven. Now we will sum the moments about point A in vector format. And the three forces will be T sub EC, T sub BD, and our minus 270J. And we have to define the position vectors, which are going to be a lot easier this time. R from E to A only changes its X coordinate, and that's just six minus zero, so that's R is six I. R from B to A changes only the x coordinate and that's six plus two is eight. So R of B slash A equals eight I. And our position vector from point A to W doesn't really matter that we establish it because W X straight down and it's a nice simple 2D problem. We really only need to know the perpendicular distance from W to point A, and that's just four feet. So XW minus XA is four feet. YW minus YA, again, doesn't matter. If you took the cross product of that vector with W, you're just gonna get zero anyway. Now we will sum the moments about point A 
and we'll be able to find the magnitudes T sub BD and T sub EC. When we do this cross product, we're going to have to be careful that we cross our unit vectors correctly. That's why I've trotted out our unit vector cross product chart. Our first term in the cross product is 8i crossed with TBD and minus 2 thirds i. But i cross i is 0, so we don't get a term there. Second cross product is 8 in i crossed with a third in j, and i cross j is k, that begets 8 thirds of TBD. Plus, our next term is 8 feet in i crossed with minus 2 thirds in k, which will get us 16 thirds times TBD times J, because I cross K is negative J, and negative J times negative 2 thirds times 8 is positive 16 thirds times J. Our next term is 6 feet I cross TEC times minus 6 sevenths I. I cross I is 0, so we don't get a term there. Next one is 6 feet and I crossed with TEC times 3 sevenths J. I cross J is K. And 6 times 3 is 18. That's where we get 18 sevenths TEC times K. The next term is 6 foot and I crossed with 2 sevenths in K is 12 sevenths times I cross K, and that's minus J, and that's where we get this term, minus 12 sevenths TEC. This leads to two equations and two unknowns. You sum the multipliers of K to 0 and sum the multipliers of J is 0, and that's all I've done here at the bottom of the slide. And then you get T sub EC is 315 pounds and T sub BD is 101.25 pounds. Now we'll sum the forces to zero in vector format. And then we can substitute our newly obtained values of magnitude T sub BD and magnitude T sub EC to find magnitudes A sub X, A sub Y, and A sub Z. When we sum all the forces in vector format, we get this top equation. And when we sum the forces and expand them as multipliers of unit vector i and j and k, we get this next equation. And now we got to do a lot of algebra in order to get a term for a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z. So let's just do a sub x as an example. A sub x then is 2 thirds of T sub BD plus 6 sevenths of T sub EC here. And we substitute values of that, 2 thirds of 101.25 plus 6 sevenths times 315. And we get 337.5. We go about this algebraic exercise for AY and AZ. And we get that AY is 101.2. And a sub z is minus 22.5. Our last problem of this lecture is sample problem 4.10. Well, we will determine the tension in a cable supporting a pipe. The diagram is on the left. It's not a very robust way for pipes to support a 450 pound load with just one cable between G and E. Real pipes are supported by a whole bunch of cables. This red pipe here is a fire sprinkler hanging and bracing product. And this sprinkler system pipe is supported by five small white cables and two big black cables. It's not going anywhere. It's basically over designed and there's no way we can do this kind of vector mechanics problem in this class. Either it's too complicated, so we'll go back to our diagram on the left with socket joints A and D holding the ends of the pipe in place and one cable connected between E and G holding the pipe in place. Point E is at the midpoint of this section of pipe between B and C. So we're going to determine 
where point G should be located if the tension T in the cable is to be a minimum. And we'll determine the corresponding minimum value of the tension. First, we draw our free body diagram shown in figure one. Reactions A and D have three components, each in I, J, and K. And vector T for our unknown tension points between point E and somewhere on the wall. It's just defined as point G, but we don't have an exact location just yet. So we'll compute vector T from the vector equilibrium equation sum of the moments about line AD equal to zero. Now that is a scalar because whenever you take a series of moments or one moment about a line, you get a scalar. Now we have to define that scalar product. Well, we know that position vector AE connecting A to E crossed with tension T is the moment about point A and vector lambda that connects A and D will be used in a scalar product with that cross product of vector AE cross T to get the projection of AE cross T on line AD. That's the core definition of a scalar product for a moment. The second component of our equilibrium equation is that we have to take the weight W, which is acting at point C and acting down, that's our 450 pound weight, has to be crossed with vector AC, and then we have to take the scalar product with the same vector lambda that is on line AD. So our moment A sub D actually has these two components. And we're going to have to do a lot of vector math to find what vector t is. Well, the first thing we do is find a value for the scalar product, lambda dot ac cross w. We can compute it all because there's no unknowns in that equation. Point c is x2, point a is x1, and x sub c is 12. There's our 12. x sub a is 0. 12 minus 0 is 12. Y at point C is also 12, minus zero is 12, and Z at point C is six, and Z at point A is six, so that gets zero. So that vector R of C slash A, which is also vector AC, is equal to 12I plus 12J. Now we take the cross product of that with W, which is minus 450J, and it will have two terms, 12I cross with minus 450J, which is minus 5400K, and 12J cross with minus 450J is zero, and hence that cross product is minus 5400 in K. Now we have to find a position vector R of D slash A, Point D is the x2, y2, z2 term, and point A is again x1, y1, and z1, which is why xd minus xa is 12, yd minus ya is 12, but zd minus za is now minus 6 because z sub d is on the yx plane and has a value of 0 and z sub a is at z equals 6, so 0 minus 6 is minus 6. The length of vector a d is just the square root of 12 squared plus 12 squared plus minus 6 squared, and that comes out to 18. Vector lambda is equal to vector a d divided by length a d, so that's 12 divided by 18, which is 2 thirds in I. 12 divided by 18 is plus 2 thirds in J. And minus 6 divided by 18 is minus a third in K. Now we can do our scalar product. Lambda dot AC cross W is 2 thirds I plus 2 thirds J minus 1 third K dot minus 5400 in K, which just has one term because I dot K is zero, J dot K is zero, K dot K is one, 
minus a third times minus 5400 is 1800. Now we have to find an expression for the minimum value of magnitude t. Well, we've already computed one term in our scalar moment, that's plus 1800, which means that lambda dot ae cross t has got to be minus 1800 pound feet because they both got to sum to zero. And using the commutative property for mixed triple products, lambda dot ae cross t is equal to t dot lambda cross ae. So we set that term to minus 1800 pound feet. Now we'll find a direction that minimizes the magnitude of t. We just learned that the scalar product of t and lambda cross ae is equal to minus 1800, which is constant. And that constant equals the magnitude of the two vectors times cosine theta. If theta equals zero degrees, cosine theta equals one, and the scalar product is maximized the magnitude of t can be minimized. Vector t should be parallel to the vector lambda cross ae. It's easier to understand that if we look at the diagram on the bottom. Here we show vector t prime at a 60 degree angle to the vector lambda cross ae. And if theta equals 60 degrees, cosine theta equals a half. In the next diagram, we draw vector t parallel to the vector lambda cross ae. With theta equals zero degrees, cosine theta equals one. And if the scalar product of the two vectors is a constant, that means that the magnitude of t can be half the magnitude of t prime and still get the same scalar product. Now we can compute the vector lambda cross AE. XE minus XA is six for E, there's our six, minus zero is six. Y sub E minus Y sub A is 12 minus zero. Points A and E have the same Z value of six, so six minus six is zero. And R's of E slash A is vector AE, so that's a six times I plus a 12 times J. And now we can take our cross product where we bring back vector lambda into the mix. Two thirds I crossed with six I is zero because I cross I is zero. Two thirds J crossed with six I is 12 thirds, which is four times j cross i, j cross i is negative k, so here's a minus 4k term. Minus the third k crossed with 6i is minus 2 times k cross i, and k cross i is a j, so here's a minus 2 times j. Two thirds j crossed with 12j is just zero, because j cross j is zero. Minus the third k, crossed with 6i is minus 2 times k cross i, which is j. So here's our minus 2j. And minus a third k times 12j is minus 4 times k times j. k times j is minus i, so that's minus i times minus 4 is 4i. And that's how we get these four terms in red. We got to combine the two k terms to get that lambda cross AE is 4i minus 2j plus 4k. Now we have to find the direction of vector t min. Well, we just calculated lambda cross AE, and the length of that vector would be 6, 4 squared plus minus 2 squared plus 4 squared. And we know that this vector t min is parallel by definition to lambda cross AE, which means it has to have the same unit vector. So we just express vector t min as magnitude t times the same unit vector, two thirds i minus one third j plus two thirds k. Now we can calculate t min because we will first calculate the magnitude t. The scalar product of t dot 
lambda cross AE is shown here. It's magnitude T times 2 thirds I minus 1 third J plus 2 thirds K dot our vector product of lambda cross AE, which is 4I minus 2J plus K. And by prior equation, that has to be equal to minus 1800. Do the vector math, 2 thirds I times 4I is 8 thirds times 1, of course. Minus a third, minus 2 thirds is plus 2 thirds. Plus 2 thirds times 4 is 8 thirds. And all of that times T is minus 1800, which means that T equals minus 300. We substitute T equals minus 300 into the vector for T minimum. And we multiply minus 300 times 2 thirds to get minus 200 times I. Minus 300 times minus a third gets 100 times J, and minus 300 times 2 thirds is minus 200 times K. Now we got to find where point G is. Vectors T min and E G have the same direction because that was the whole point of calculating both a magnitude and a direction. Now we know where T min points, which means when it hits the Y X plane, it defines point G on the plane. Point E is at 6, 12, 6 from the prior diagrams. Point G, we don't know its X and Y coordinates. We just know that Z equals 0 because that's the definition of the wall in this diagram. The wall is the Y, X plane. So we can calculate our vector R sub G, E. It's x minus 6 times i plus y minus 12 times j minus 6 times k. But because that vector is parallel to the vector t sub min, we know that x minus 6 has to be to minus 200. What y minus 12 has to be to plus 100 what minus 6 has to be to minus 200. And we set that equation up. And from this equation, we can calculate a value for x and a value for y. Well, x is 0 because x minus 6 over minus 200 has to equal 0 minus 6 over minus 200. So x has to be 0. This point g is actually on the y-axis. Now, y minus 12 is to 100 as minus 6 is to minus 200. So that's y minus 12 over 100 is equal to 3 over 100, which means that y minus 12 equals 3 and y equals 15. So point G is actually located on the y-axis at x equals 0, y equals 15, z equals zero.